Ladies and gentlemen, dear scientists and engineers, in the last movie, we have seen the motion. And today, in this section, we will see what causes motion, that is, the forces which cause the motion. Let's first remember what we saw. We defined displacement as the change in position. Average velocity is the ratio of displacement to the time it took for the displacement to take place. Please note that displacement, velocity, and position are all vectorial quantities. Instantaneous velocity is the derivative of displacement with respect to time. And of course, it is the same as the derivative of position with respect to time, since the initial position is constant and does not contribute to the derivative. Average acceleration we defined as change in velocity divided by the time it took for the change to take place and instantaneous acceleration as the derivative of velocity with respect to time. These formulas can be inverted. The change in velocity is the acceleration of, is the integral of acceleration over time. Please note that the integral variable and integral limit are not the same, and velocity is a function of the integral limit. Displacement or change in position is the integral of velocity over time. Again, integration variable and limit are not the same, and displacement is a function of the integration limit. Now, we are going to investigate what causes this motion. Until Newton's time, that is 17th, 17th century, people believed that to have motion, you needed force. This was very intuitive because when I push this uh, eraser, I exert a force and it moves. I stop exerting a force and it stops. I exert a force and it moves. However, Newton, looking at Kepler's laws of motion, which he was aware of, realized that for planetary motion, the acceleration was always directed towards the sun and velocity was directed in all directions in space. This uh, indicated to him that it was the uh, acceleration which required force and not the velocity. Another reasoning for it was the relative concept of relative velocity from Galileo. This eraser, which is at rest in your frame, is in motion in my frame when I am walking around. Now, obviously, there is no force acting on that eraser. However, in my frame, it is in motion. And from this, one can infer that to keep a constant velocity, one does not need force. So, uh, Newton's first law of motion is that we need force for acceleration and not for velocity. Force, on, force being zero implies and is implied by acceleration equals zero, not velocity. You can say this, you can have a free velocity, but you cannot have a free acceleration. Now, 
then what happened to that razor if we have a force only for acceleration? What caused this thing to come to rest when I stop pushing it? Well, the answer to that is it was brought to rest not because of lack of force, but because of the existence of a frictional force, some force that made it stop. So Newton then came up with this concept where you do not need a force to maintain motion. You need force for changing motion. Please note that acceleration here means change in velocity. And that can mean either change in magnitude of the velocity or the direction of the velocity. If you are talking about, for example, uniform circular motion, it is accelerated with a centripetal acceleration. And to maintain that, you need a centripetal force, that is a force towards the center. Now, when there is force, then there is acceleration. And the Newton's second law is that acceleration is proportional to the force per unit amount of matter. So if you have a mass which is twice as large, you need twice the force to accelerate it. Or conversely, if you have twice the force and the same mass, you will have twice the acceleration. This is the uh, Newton's second law of motion. And we have a third law, which says whenever a body is under some force, it exerts an equal and opposite reaction force. Now, please note that this third law is valid even when the body is in motion and also when the body is at rest. If I take this razor and uh, throw it in some direction, I exert a force on this, but the eraser itself is exerting a similar magnitude force in opposite direction on me. It is obvious in the static case. If I am trying to push this and it is not going anywhere, it is clear that the table is pushing me back. But it is equally valid in the dynamic case when I am pushing this and it is moving away, but it is still exerting the same force that I exert on it. It is always F react equals minus F. Another point to note here is that the force and reactionary force are not acting on the same object. When I am pushing this table, I am exerting a force on the table, and that force will be taken into account in the acceleration of the table. The force that table exerts on me is to be taken into account when you are doing my acceleration budget. So you do not add these together. OK, so these are the three laws of Newton. Please note that these are the most important things in physics one. Actually, the rest of physics one can all be derived from this. If you know this, 
uh, than the net rest of physics one you can derive from these three laws. These are the basics of mechanics. Let's look an, at an example of a, a reactionary force. Uh, in this picture, you see a carriage, and the carriage is attached to a horse. This is not an ordinary horse. It is from Narnia, and it is a talking horse. Besides, it has studied physics when it was in Narnia. The driver of the cart tells the horse to go, and the horse turns back and says, stupid driver, have you never heard of Newton? As soon as I exert a force on this cart, it will exert on me an equal and opposite force. The total will always be zero by Newton 3, and therefore, because force is zero by Newton 1, the mo acceleration will be zero. Motion is impossible. If you ever see an uh, object being moved along, it is just a figment of your imagination. Now, the argument of the horse seems to be uh, sensible. It makes horse sense, but it doesn't make common sense because we all know that horses do pull carts and we all know that people can push and pull objects and throw objects. In fact, you just saw two examples of me throwing objects around. Now, what's the mistake of this ho horse? Well, the horse is adding up forces acting on two different bodies, that is itself and the cart, and getting a zero. This is a no-no. You should find the acceleration of the horse from the forces on the horse, and accelerations of the cart from the forces on the cart. Therefore, when you are talking about the acceleration of the horse, you will see that it is pulled backward by the cart, the reaction force, yes, but it is pushing the earth back with its feet, and the reaction force to that is pushing the horse forward. The difference of these two will accelerate the horse. As for the carriage, the pull that the horse exerts on it accelerates it. So when we are calculating uh, forces, we deal only with uh, forces acting on that particular object whose acceleration we want to find and do not introduce unnecessary objects into the problem. These forces are, in nature, essentially four, one of the four basic forces. These are gravitational force, electromagnetic force, weak nuclear, and strong nuclear forces. You might say, what about the contact force when I am pushing an object? Well, it is electromagnetic force between the atoms in my hand and the atoms in the object I am pushing. What about the frictional force? It is again here. What about the lift that or buoyancy that water provides an object floating on it? Again, electromagnetic. What about viscous force? Again, electromagnetic. So in physics one, we will see some applications of the electromagnetic force and gravitational force. These are in nuclear physics and in this course, none of our business. What are the units of force? Well, units of force can be seen from the equation F equals MA the unit of mass is kilogram, 
acceleration is meter per second square. So the unit of force is kilogram meter per second square. To honor Newton, who introduced these laws, we call this a Newton. One Newton is the force needed to accelerate one kilogram mass by one meter per second square. If you remember that gravitational acceleration is about 10 meters per second square, the weight of an one kilogram object is 10 newtons. Weight is a force, the gravitational force on an object, and weight is uh, the force needed to give it this acceleration of gravity. Bigger and smaller units are kilonewton, which is 1,000 newton, meganewton, 10 to the 6 newtons, or millinewton newtons. When you are talking about a person pulling or pushing something, we are talking about newtons. When you are talking about the uh, force a locomotive exerts on a train, we are talking about kilonewtons. The last topic we have to talk in this chapter is about the forces seen by accelerated observers. These are called fictitious forces. We can see that the acceleration seen by an accelerated observer, the relative acceleration, is the acceleration of the object minus the acceleration of the observer. The acceleration is different from the actual acceleration. And since F equals MA is valid, then we must have some extraneous forces to account for this. These are not actual forces. So they are called fictitious forces and sometimes ghost forces. They are ghosts. Now, the first example would be if I put some uh, alcoholic drink in this and drink it, then it will not stay as in the cup and I will stay moving and will say, hey, cop, stay where you are. Do not go away. Now, obviously, the cup is where it is at rest. I am accelerating. But in my frame, it is, and I see some ghost or fictitious forces causing it to accelerate. Similarly, in the dolmuş that you see here, breaking rapidly to pick up a passenger, everybody else is hanging on for dear life. What is pushing them forward is not an actual force. They are actually accelerating backwards by the help of the forces created from wherever they managed to hold on. They are taking part in the deceleration of the dolmuş. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings an end to uh, the most important chapter in Physics 1. In fact, remember, all of Physics 1 is just an application of Newton's laws.